You know, I can't claim that in my, you know, early 20s I had this grand plan to start developing techniques for early cancer detection. Um, in fact, I started out in high energy physics and uh, fortuitously the first year of graduate school they killed the super colliding superconductor and I said, there's probably not going to be any jobs for me. And so I looked around and optical technology seemed really appealing. Now, the specific focus on early cancer detection um, was driven by, uh, you know, a personal story of mine. And, you know, if you talk with most people, they have a relative or a friend where they were taken by cancer and they didn't find it until it was too late. Uh, for me, it was my father-in-law. Um, in 2002, he was on the golf course. He had a pain in his stomach and um, he was dead three weeks later from pancreatic cancer. And it really drove home the fact that our methods for early cancer detection are poor. Usually, we don't find it until it's too late. So um, this has been an overriding factor in my work, trying to move the threshold forward of detection to try and offer the best opportunity for uh, intervention. My name is Adam Wax. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at Duke University, and I'm also a member of the Fitzpatrick Institute for Photonics. Usually in imaging, you're limited by the wavelength of your uh, illumination. So uh, typically you can get down to half micron type resolution. In light scattering, instead of trying to resolve these various details, you scatter light and learn information about the structure. So you can actually get around this resolution limit if you're looking for just a specific feature. In the case of my research, we're doing this to measure the size of cell nuclei, which turns out to be very diagnostically useful for early cancer detection. If you just scatter light from tissue, and uh, I think almost everyone's done this experiment where you put a flashlight over your hand, you can see all the light just sort of emerging in a diffuse glow. And that's because the dominant process is scattering, so the light moves around. You can't actually see the shadow of your bones when you do that. So in order to be able to get the single scattered light that's interacted with the nuclei just once, we use a coherence gating scheme. That's the same thing that's used in optical coherence tomography. So the low coherence interferometry provides us depth resolution, so we can isolate the scattering from particular tissue layers. In our case, the basal layer of the epithelium is the most useful, and it's roughly two to 300 microns beneath the tissue surface. One of the first changes that you see in cells when they go down the road towards cancer is there's an enlargement in the size of the cell nucleus. So all that genetic material is arranged in a very, you know, um, intentional manner by an excellent engineer. And um, when the things don't fit together quite right, uh, the nucleus becomes enlarged. And this is the hallmark that we look for in our early cancer detection scheme. So they increase from anywhere from you know, 10 microns up to, let's say, 13 microns. When we first started out, we would study cells in vitro, you know, cells in a dish, and um, these were good validation experiments. We then moved on to ex vivo tissues, animal tissues, and even human tissues in the pathology lab. Uh, but now we do it in vivo. We have a fiber optic probe that goes down the biopsy channel of the endoscope, goes in gentle contact with the tissue. And we can actually measure the size of cell nuclei as a function of depth within that tissue. And we use this as an early uh, indicator of precancerous lesions. So not only am I a professor at Duke, but I'm also the founder and chairman of Oncoscope Inc. This is a spin-out company from Duke University where we're commercializing our early cancer detection technology. Um, it can be a challenge to get technology out of the university, uh, as simple as licensing the patents, um, to raising money, to finding good people to actually run your company. So there has been an increasing focus in translational research lately. Uh, it's always been a rather unglamorous part of research. So, you know, the first paper where you generate a, a result that shows a new technique is always very exciting. But then, you know, you've got to do a lot of research before it's usable as a biomedical technology. Uh, so I first invented my early cancer detection technique back in early 2000, so it was uh, 2002. And here we are 10 years later and we're just reporting on the first clinical results of it. So in between there was a lot of, you know, not necessarily front page news about generating a fiber optic approach, making the uh, software go quick enough to be acceptable to clinicians, um, developing sterilization protocols, and it's just not the most glamorous thing, so um, you know, it doesn't get the front page attention. But it is a very important part. Uh, you, know, you think that you're going to generate this new technology for, let's say, cancer detection, and companies are going to you know, beat a path to your door to commercialize it for you. But unless you reach a sufficiently advanced point that they see the benefit of it, um, it's not going to happen. So very often you have to do this translational research to get there. Uh, at Duke University, we have a Coulter Translational Partnership. This is an arrangement with the Coulter Foundation where they sponsor translational research. Uh, biomedical engineering faculty partner with an um, investigator from the medical school to translate a technology to clinical usage. And uh, this was actually a key step for me in getting my technology into the clinic. 
Uh, I partnered with uh, Nicholas Shaheen, who is a, a leader in Barrett's esophagus work at UNC. And uh, through the sponsorship of Coulter, we were able to get our first human study done. And it was, uh, you know, helped us bridge the uh, proverbial valley of death, which uh, you always hear about in entrepreneurship. I'm proud to say that uh, here we are six years later, my company's still here. We've survived the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, there's been a lot of upheaval at the FDA, uh, but we've managed to raise some venture money. Um, we've also received good government support in the form of grants, and uh, we're gearing up to do an FDA trial, which is a necessary step in the U.S. if you're going to market a biomedical um, imaging device. Our technology is applicable to any epithelial tissue. So this is the part of your body that comes in contact with the environment. So if you're exposed to a carcinogen, for example, you would expect to find cancer in the epithelium first. And that comprises 85% of all cancers. It may be a brain cancer that ultimately causes uh, mortality, but um, it may have actually started as a colon cancer or other type of epithelial cancer. So um, we believe our technology is a platform technology. Uh, we're going for esophageal cancer first, but we believe it's applicable to the colon, the oral cavity, uh, the cervix in the woman, the bladder, perhaps even lung cancer.